job, guys. Good to see you. My name is Randy. Uh, great crowd. Way to show up today. We got an almost full house today, so we're awful glad to have you. And uh, for those of you viewing online out there, thank you. There's usually as many of you out there as there are in here, and we know that. And um, thank you, by the way, some who have uh, let us know. Let me know who you are and how we can help you, how we can send you information or or pray for you, and we'd love for you to continue to do that with the monitor or just uh, afterwards click on to our site. And uh, in the room here, the hospitality tent serves as a good purpose to uh, ask some questions and get some information or to actually make next step decisions, as we call it here, too. And of course, we have a, a time where we invite you at the end of every service after I finish our talk here. Um, we invite you just to come forward and allow us the opportunity to pray for you or to celebrate a decision you've made toward membership or a deeper walk with the Lord or whatever that might look like. So we're starting a, just a two-part series today on how people grow. And I think that um, many of us are kind of going through that evaluation at the first of every year. You look back and say, how did I do with God, and what are my strengths and weaknesses? Where did I fail? And then, as we always challenge you to do here, go into the new year with a plan, some type of spiritual growth plan involving the Scripture, your prayer, your involvement with groups maybe here, however that might look. And so, they're called spiritual disciplines. We talk about them, mention them about every day here in this place, and of course, um, Prayer and the Scripture are the obvious. Can't get away from those. But there's also a lot of other disciplines that enhance that, like solitude and silence and things of that nature. So we'll be looking at two aspects of that uh, in the next two weeks also. So I do want to send thank you, uh, Braden, I mean, um, Valerie, for leading us in prayer a minute ago. We do want to remember... Uh, one couple of our own, I think they probably are not here because, oh, no, they are here, the Zimmermans. Gary and Jerry Zimmerman leave later this afternoon to go to Bolivia. They have founded a, an orphanage, which is doing a great job, a great work down there. Some of you have been down there. They're going to be there for the next three weeks, and so we do need to continue to pray for God's work there this time also. So we'll do that. So how about let's get rolling, Isaiah 58 is where we'll start with how people grow. While you find that, you know, for some reason, Day, I am hungry more so than usual. Are you hungry, Bert? God, what's the problem here? New Year and my stomach's growling and everything. It's getting to be a little bit distracting. I tell you what, I'll be right back, okay? Today I'm in a little bit of a hurry. How about a, a roast beef and a Diet Coke, and that'll be all. Thank you. Tell Braden to do a song. It's going to be just a minute. He's found a dime, put it up and truck it. Are we going to do what they say can't be done? We've got a long way to go. Short time to get there. I'm peace bound up. Watch your bandit run.
I'm ready to go now. Thank you. So the topic today is on fasting. Have you heard that yet? So we are in Isaiah 58. Thank you, uh, Braden, the creative genius of Braden Kirshner at work once again. And uh, also Chuck Bolin for letting me jack his truck for a while. Um, so we do want to talk about this. Some of you are probably maybe who are not super familiar or experienced with the discipline of fasting. What in the world is that all about? Why do you need to? What is it? What's it look like? And all like that. Bottom line is some of you are asking probably, what's, what's the spirit got to do with my stomach? Well, we're going to answer that through the scripture today because the real intent of fasting is to make us more attentive to God. Anything that makes us more focused on knowing God and following Him and following His plan for our life, that, y'all, is a good thing. And Isaiah 58 is one of the classic parts of the teaching on fasting. And also over in Matthew 6, Jesus mentions it at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And he's one of... He takes that occasion to sort of compare how the Pharisees, the religious leaders, do it in those days to how it ought to be done. For instance, he says, when, not if, when you fast, don't go around like they do. They moan and they groan and they don't shave, they don't wash, they make it obvious that they're fasting so you'll like think they're so holy and righteous, you know, they make such a big deal out of it. And everybody in town knows that they're fasting. Don't do it that way. Go about your normal business. Don't call attention to yourself. Don't make it public knowledge. That's something between you and the Lord anyway, unless you have to explain what you're doing. Just do it as unto the Lord. And I really think that maybe one reason he seemed especially irritated was he'd probably been to church on some Sabbaths and saw the show that they were putting on as fasting. He was fasting at the same time and not doing any of those things. And it probably, it probably irritated him. So it's about just being more attentive. What's the definition of fasting? You don't eat. <laughs> I can't make it more simple than that. You just go without eating for a while. You drink water maybe. You do not eat for a certain length of time. How long? That's between you and the Lord also. There's a lot of other ways to fast. I know some of you observe uh, doing without something for uh, a period of time for Lent. You know, I'm going to give up this. I'm going to give up sweets. I'm going to give up caffeine or something like that. Fasting, the normal fast, as it's called, is you just do not eat for a while, whether it be a day, whether it be three days, whether it be three weeks. Uh, and it should be God's idea. It should be something that you really feel led to, and we'll open that up in a second too. Well, is it very prominent? Well, it's mentioned 44 times in the Old Testament. It's mentioned 31 times in the New Testament. Did anybody noteworthy ever do it? Well, have you ever heard of Moses and Elijah and King David? They all practiced. And, and Daniel, they practiced fasting. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, who wrote a third of our New Testament, he fasted quite regularly. Oh, and the best example I can give you, Jesus himself. Jesus fasted. And so I think it's something that we do need to look at and um, speaking of the spiritual disciplines, these might be fairly good resources for you if you want to start out the new year. This is a classic. It was done about 25 years ago by Richard Foster. It's called Celebration of Discipline. This changed my perspective when I read it coming out of seminary that year. He just takes a chapter. There's not a lot written on fasting. He's got a whole chapter devoted to it. And it's really good. I think it's in our uh, library here if you want to check it out. <clears throat> this one is a very recent one. It's only a year or two old. It's called Live No Lies by John Mark Comer. He's a young pastor um, who's now more on the writing and speaking tour, but he is, uh, does a, a fantastic job of talking about spiritual disciplines and the value of them. Um, this is another classic from maybe 20 years ago, Knowing God, J.I. Packer. This is one of those, it's hard, to, it, it's hard to communicate with somebody you don't know. And his thing is, let me describe God all the ways I can by his attributes, by his characteristics. Then when you try to engage with God, you'll know a little bit better who you're talking to here. And this is a, f a fantastic 
Fantastic read. I know people who are really strong Christ followers that read this about every year. They just try to go back through it every year. Okay? So let's move on. I thought maybe one way to do it, as usual, we're going to read maybe verse by verse through some Scripture, and then we'll talk about what it means to us, what it means and what it means to us. But let's talk first about what fasting is not. There's a lot of myths. There's a lot of wrong ideas about fasting. And so let's do that first. The first thing that it is not from, 50, from uh, Isaiah 58, 3, first part of verse 3, it's not a customer service hotline, all right? It's not one of those, hey, I need this. Oh, and by the way, you need to do this for me. Verse 3, why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? He's talking to God. Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed or reacted or responded or change the situation. Something's going on in these people's lives, 700 B.C., and they're like, we're fasting because we need something from you, God, and we haven't seen it happen yet. We all have, we all are born with this self-interest, this self-centeredness. Now, some of that is necessary for survival, but in a, especially this society we live in, it is the king and queen of all ideologies, it seems. And that collides with the whole mindset of fasting. There are times, and we're going to get into this, there are times that you need to fast because something does need to happen, and it involves you. But that cannot be the sole reason is what, is what he is saying here. God is not up there in heaven just writing out stimulus checks for all of us, for whatever our ailment and whatever our current need of the day is. It just doesn't work like that. Um, the, the key question to this first point is, are we on this earth to be served by God or are we on this earth to serve Him? That orients the motive base for why and if we fast. Now, let me say this too. I understand some people medically, you cannot fast. It's going to be really dangerous for you if you don't have the intake of food occasionally. So I'm not even, uh, you know, I'm not even going there about how you ought to. You should not. But for those who can, it's a discipline that we ought to really consider because he's wanting to make us more attentive to him. So that's the first thing. The second thing that it is not is a substitute for proper living. It's not somehow, I know I live like a scoundrel six days of the week, but man, I, I might start fasting one day just to balance everything out. It obviously does. Look at the rest of verse 3. Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please, and you exploit all your workers. See what he's getting at? How can you be like that in the marketplace but pretend to be a really devoted, God-fearing man or woman here, you even fast, when the two don't match up. We cannot use it just to substitute. Now, he's, he's getting to a justice issue here. What he's basically saying to them is, you, re, you require compassion by your employees and a certain amount of mercy, but I don't see you giving any out to them. It is a hypocritical stance that, we're, that you're taking. If our sole reason for deprivation, I'm going to withdraw, I'm going to, you know, let, if you decide I'm going I'm to not eat for two or three days, the sole motive for that is to not somehow balance the scales because we really got out there in the woods two weekends ago, and we, knew, and we know that we didn't please God with that, but this will make it all equal out. It can't be that. That's a surface level, very shallow thing. And can I, can I suggest this, guys? <clears throat> That's a form of idolatry, just like believing and worshiping in another God. As God sees it up there, it's idolatrous. What's got to happen is our desires have to start lining up with the God who really is. And we come to Him as the sovereign, creating, loving, but principled God. Psalm 37, 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. 
that should be more of an indicator of fasting because he's wanting to make us more attentive. So there's the second one, not a customer service, gimme, gimme type. He's not going to just magically offset our immorality or our sinfulness by fasting a day or two. The third thing is it's not a veiled coercion. We can't use it to manipulate God. Look at verse 4 and 5. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Again, he's saying your lifestyle doesn't match the discipline of fasting here. Five, is this the kind of fast that I have chosen? God speaking. Only a day for a man to humble himself? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and lying on sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Three rhetorical questions. The obvious answer to all of those questions is no, no, no. Is your spending a day withdrawing from food, withholding food, going to make you a better person when there's nothing else in your life that has changed? No, no, and no. There needs to be, y'all, when you do a fast, there needs to be a meaning. There needs to be a purpose. The best kind of fasts are the ones you feel like God told you to do. You feel led. There's something troubling you so deeply. There's something missing. Uh, With some, there's this sense of anticipation. Something's coming into my life. I don't know if it's going to be good or bad have no way of knowing that, to be prepared for it. I just feel like maybe I need to spend a little bit more time focused on prayer. And the thought originally was, in those times you would be eating and preparing a meal, spend that time in prayer. If you're doing a fast and you still got to go to work, like all, most of you do, and this stuff and all like that, you can't necessarily do that. But then the thought is an attitude of just seeking God as you work, as you do your normal schedule. Just just have a heart. But the two, seeking God in prayer and fasting, do typically go together there. So what do we mean by veiled coercion? Uh, some of us have lived by the elder brother syndrome, I'll call it. Remember the prodigal son? Guy has two sons. They get older. Uh, one of them's the, the firstborn. He's going to do the right thing. He does the responsible thing. He's working hard on the farm. The other one, though, uh, he is a different cat, and he decides, I want out of here. I want my inheritance now. I know you're not dead yet. I mean, how insulting that is to your father. And for some reason, the father gives it to him, right? He goes out. He lives like the devil for however long. He's having a high old time until the money runs out. The money, uh, the friends leave when the, when the money leaves. And so now he trudges back home. Everybody is thrilled to see the return of the prodigal son except the older brother. Now, I could make a case for this older brother. I'm a firstborn. Any of y'all firstborn? Doesn't that rub you raw a little bit? Wait a minute. I've been pulling on the rope extra hard because he abandoned us. The point is this. At the end of the story that Jesus told, who's sitting inside the house having fellowship with the Father, and who's standing outside in the cold looking in by his own choice? The elder brother. Why did we, if you unpack it, the elder brother did what he did out of duty, out of obligation, and now he's looking at the Father as if you owe me. I've been the good one. If you're going to treat him so well, you need to especially treat me well. There's no love involved. There's no loyalty especially that comes from a true motive. He's trying to coerce his father into honoring him just because he's done the right thing. At this point, y'all, we need to inspect our own salvation. Richard Foster, who wrote that celebration of discipline I just showed you, he said this. I think it's a great quote. He says, when we fast, sometimes we are tempted to believe that we can have God eating out of our hand. 
Now, salvation is by grace alone through faith in Jesus Christ. But if your salvation happened because you improved your life and you've done the right thing and you go to church and you give to the poor and we can go on and on from there, all those are great things, but that is not the gospel of salvation. We got to be really clear here. The theology is called soteriology. If your soteriology says, I belong to the family of God because I have been a good person, or I do the communion and I got baptized one time, that is not true salvation. I'm not saying you don't have a relationship with Christ, but what I'm saying is it came through some other manner than that. Here's the raw truth. We were busted and bankrupt day one that we were born. We were never close to God. We were aliens. We were far away from Him. And when we got old enough to, to realize how desperately wicked, evil we were and how bankrupt spiritually we were, and we cried out to Him because there is no other way, and we realized that that's why He took to the cross was to save me. I'm responsible for putting Him on the cross, and His blood atoned for my sins. And then when He got resurrected out of the grave, that's God saying, man, if I can whip death, I can certainly take your sins away, and I can redeem you, and I can start you on a restored path. If that's what we signed on for, you're part of the family. So we have to be really clear about that, because if we're living by the other model, I'm ducking in and out, and I'm trying to be a good person. And uh, I think I've earned my way to heaven. God will never be trifled with. God is not to be played. He will never allow that to happen. Now, He does love you. And He does want you with Him in eternity. And He does have a unbelievably fantastic plan for the rest of your life. But it doesn't come by being a holy person. It comes by being a broken person who allows him to redeem us. And if fasting is a way to get there or to remind ourselves of how we got there, that's a, that's a good thing, y'all. Fasting, though, is not about results. It's not, it can't be part of your business plan. It's got to be his idea on his terms for his reason. Y'all, there is a slim line between boldly approaching the throne of grace, which we're taught to do in the Scripture, and trying to manipulate God. And when we cross that line, and I'm going to be, I've, I have... I have crossed that line. I told somebody out on the porch between services, I have spent a large portion of my life advising God on what he ought to do. And, and as I stand here before you, I got nothing to show for it, except a lot of frustration. He's not really listening. And let me tell you this, I am grateful to God today for how many times he did not answer my prayer as I asked him to. My life would have been a whole different trajectory if he had said, okay, I'll give you what you think you need. So he's, he's not to be trifled with. He is to be someone we are attentive to. And so we're back to that. So can I just give you a warning? Now we're going to get to the important stuff. The important stuff is... Like, what is it? What is fasting like? But, but a couple of warnings. Some of you are going to grin because you have fasted and you know exactly how this works. If you decide to fast, whether it's, you know, whatever the length is, not that important, that will be the morning that your coworker shows up with two dozen Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> and they are sitting right down from your office or your cube or wherever you are, and you can't, you, you walk by them 18 times that day. 
you'll notice this. Every single commercial that comes on TV will be like the most scrumptious, piping hot hamburger cheeseburger with grease just oozing out of it. <laughs> Holy cow. That'll be the week or the day when your best customer who like when he, when he says jump, you jump. You say how high. He calls you and he says, I tell you what, you've been so good to me. Let me take you out to lunch tomorrow. And now you're thinking, oh, my goodness, this is my best customer. It's going to be so awkward. I'm going to have to explain to him why I'm not eating and maybe offending him for that. That's just, just set your watch. That's going to happen. So what is fasting? Let's look at verse 6. First thing is seeking God's will flat out seeking God's will. Verse 6, it is, is this not the kind of fasting I have chosen, to loose the chains of justice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Um, justice is a big issue with God. He is a just God, and in the end, He will balance the scales. It should be a big deal with us. This is the part of fasting where you say, we say we still got to do our part. And where you and I see injustice and it's something that we can address, we can do something to correct, absolutely we should do it. My brother up there and, and my sister up there in the balcony go to the Dominican Republic all the time. And there are some issues up there, I would guarantee you, if you break it down and say, why do you keep doing that? Why do you keep spending all that money to go? It comes down to, in some of those cases, justice. Things are not like they should be there. I know somebody that in the world of uh, foster care and adoption, whew, they prayed for seven years for two little boys, seven long years. And as that thing got closer and closer to a resolution, either in the bad way or the good day, it's time to fast and pray because there's something broken that should be corrected. And there was an opportunity for it to either get corrected forever or broken forever. That's an indication. What is God's will? What, what would God have happened there? Another, time, another thing that sometimes it boils down to is God is preparing you for a calling or a sending or something. Uh, Jesus is the great example of that. Matthew 4, verse 1, he, he gets baptized as like the, hey, I'm announcing, I'm proclaiming now that my ministry is kicked off. But the very next thing, the very next verse says the Spirit drove him. The Spirit drove him out into the wilderness for 40 days. What's he doing out in the wilderness for 40 days? He is fasting and he is praying for 40 long days. This is his preparation time for the next three years ending on the cross. He knows it. And he needs to be as prepared. Well, I thought he was son of God. Absolutely a son of God. He's also son of man. And he needs to be as prepared as he possibly can. If there's something going on and you feel like another is for transitions, that's what's going on too in Jesus' life at that point. Have you ever had these days when you're like, something's coming? There's a sense of anticipation. You don't know what it is. You don't know if it's going to be good or going to be bad. All you feel like is this heavy spiritual presence of like something is about to happen. Man, sometimes that's a good time to like, I want to be ready either way. I want to be prepared. I don't want to miss the purpose of it. And so maybe I need to just fast for a while to do that too. Those are great reasons to do it, seeking God's will. Another is meeting the needs of others. Look at verse 7. Is it not to share your food with the hungry? and provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe him and to not turn away from your own flesh and blood back to doing our part. There's a time to pray and there's a time to move our feet, right? And, and he's talking about the, home, the uh, balance of that. Um, th there, this pre uh, fasting sin tends to add a certain amount of power to our prayers. And, and these issues are the obvious issues. 
And let me just take this time out at the close of our, our uh, calendar year and our budget year here to thank you for your giving. You have enabled a second location to start. You've enabled so much great ministry. You've enabled people to go on mission to other countries. You've enabled so much. Uh, one thing that surprised me five years ago when I came down here, I told the first hour was how many homeless people there are in Somerville. And they make a regular tour by our church office. And our ladies on the support team do a fantastic job of sorting through them. And I'll just, uh, I'll just tell you, the answer to these folks is yes many more times than it is no. Can we get used at times, and do we get used at times? Oh, I'm sure we do. But we're not God either. And so we do keep records, and we do recognize faces but there are many, many days, and a few days ago when it got so cold around here, I'm thankful to tell you because you gave so generously, we put two homeless men up for three nights in a, in a nice warm place because of that. And, and we do, that's, that is part of our being Christ followers. Nehemiah is a good example. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4, he's, he hears what's going on in his hometown, he's in different another country serving the king, and, and it's so bad. The news is so bad. He is broken. He weeps, but then he starts praying and fasting. He's after God's will, yes, but he's also putting himself in, that, in the role of, God, would you have me address that injustice? Would you have me go try to be an agent of change in a good way? And God was. And what came out of that prayer and fasting was a plan to go to the king and ask for a leave of absence to do just that. And God and the king both honored that. Another time is for protection. You and I, we got people in our family, and they're in trouble, and they're in danger because they're in trouble. And their choices have put them in danger. And there are times that we may just need to, you know, they're not listening. They're not getting it. They're far from me. They're far from God, but I can fast about it, and I can pray about it. First Chronicles 20, the king of Israel is surrounded by the Moabites. Moabites were the enemies last week. Man, them Moabites are bad news. They're back at it again, and they're outnumbered. The, it, the Jews are outnumbered, and what are we going to do? Woe is me. And Jehoshaphat says, there's no way militarily we're all going to get out of here alive. I tell you what. The nation needs to start fasting, and that's what they did. He calls the whole country to a fast, and God shows up and fights the battle for him. Fasting is to be more attentive to God. And the last one, maybe the most important, the last reason to fast, pursue his holiness. That should be our lifelong ambition anyway, right? Pursue his holiness. Look at verse 8. Then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear, and then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. He uses the word righteousness in here, and healing. There is a spiritual healing that we all need no matter who we are and where we are today. We've just been singing about a breakthrough. I don't know everybody's situation in here or out there, but I know that in a room this size, there's some of you who are waiting on some breakthrough. There is something going on that's beyond you. You have no control over it, except to get as close to God as you possibly can get and ask the righteousness of God to start to take over. There's another verse in Isaiah, I love the language, where he says, may the righteousness of God become a covering, and that word also meant a canopy. There's a canopy out there when you go through those front doors. If it's pouring down rain, you want to be under that canopy, right? What if the righteousness of God was our protection? Whether what's coming is a storm or whether it's healing. That's what um, fasting helps us to do also. It humbles you. Why is, humble, 
Why is humility so important? Because 1 Peter 5, 5 says we should clothe ourselves with it toward one another because God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Have you noticed if you are a person of personal humility or you're married maybe to somebody who is, have you noticed God seems to be a little more patient with her? (laughs) It's because she's humble. He doesn't have much patience with the proud people because we're the ones like me. We're the ones advising him on what he ought to do, right? It's, uh, there are times when we're going to fast for God to reveal something. There's a piece of the puzzle missing, and we have no clue. We have no way of knowing. It's in the supernatural realm. It might involve somebody you love very much. It might involve you personally. But you start fasting like, God, if you're going to reveal it to me, now would be a good time to do it. Daniel is a great example. Daniel 9, he's been fasting, and God, bang, through the angel, pops in there and says, all right, here it is. I'm going to give you a vision, and it's going to be like a mystery to you, but then I'm going to come in behind the vision. I'm going to tell you what it means. There's general revelation in this that we all, yeah, we get it. It's pretty clear. We all have to live by it. But then there's specific revelation. And it has to do with you and your place in life, what's going on in your life or what will be going on in your life. And it's a word that God would give you just for you. Prayer and fasting and the word of God is the best way to do that. The best thing you will do every day, any day, 365 days for this year is to know God. Know God. That's when you look at people and you've described them and say, hey, do you know Carol? Like in our class, do you know Sam? Yeah, I know him. He, she is spirit-filled. Those are the people that we uh, categorize as full of the Spirit. Can I give you another reminder? You cannot be full of the Spirit and be mean as a snake to other people. They don't go together. The filling of the Spirit is about being filled with God's love, right? So to say, I love Jesus, but then you follow them around and they're just like, man, that doesn't compute. Something's wrong there. Spirit's not false. Spirit doesn't lie. The Spirit is the truth serum. And one of the, and we'll talk about this, Lord willing, next week, is what, what happens when God tells you who you really are and it's not good? What do we do with that information? It's called confession. So to sum it up, fasting is a great way to get sharper, to get keener, to be more alert, in your communication, in your relationship with God. Two verses to leave you with real quick to back that up. Psalm 42, 7, David's one of the most intensely personal psalms in the whole Bible, uh, Psalm 42. In in verse 7, he's lamenting, he's in deep pain, he's in agony over what's happened. We're not sure what has happened, but he says in verse 7, deep calls to deep. And what he's saying is, there is a deep, deep, deep pain in my life. And God, I know that only you can reach into that and feel it out of the depths of your personage. If you don't come in here and you don't crawl into this deep recess in my life, nobody else will. And then uh, chapter 34, verse 8 of Psalm, I love that. That's where it says, taste and see that the Lord is good. How do you taste God? He's, He's talking about experiencing God. Taste and see that God is good. Build that relationship. Here's my last statement. This might be worth writing down, not because I'm smart, but just because it's a truth. Discipline will give you freedom. That is countercultural because who's yelling? The, the world is yelling at us the opposite, right? Discipline will take away your freedom. Don't let anybody take away your freedom. And your freedom is to do whatever in the world you want to do. Oh, no, 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 no. 
Discipline gives you freedom, whether it's physical, whether it's emotional, intellectual, especially spiritual. The more you discipline your life spiritually before God, the more freedom you have to live the life that He's given you. And it's a good life. It's not trouble-free, and it's challenging, but y'all, it is a good life. So back to the original question, what's the Spirit got to do with my stomach? All I can say is try it and you'll find out. (laughs) Try it and you will see, because He is out to help us focus and be more attentive on Him, and that's always a win for us. There's a purifying effect that goes along with it. Let me give you a, a little encouragement, too. We have life groups at the hour before this. You might want to check one of them out. They're a great way to, to, to have a social support component and also study the Scripture as a group, Iron Sharpens Iron. There's also on Wednesday nights with some Tuesday or Thursday nights and all, too, that are a little bit deeper in a specific topic area. That's called discipleship. There's some like hearing God's voice that's already out. There's some like how do you, how do you get more um, familiar with the Old Testament so you can understand that. It's called a survey of the Old Testament. That's a fantastic overview. There's one coming called experiencing God, knowing and doing the will of God, which is, you know, and there's, um, I'm, so, I'm leaving one out probably. But, hey, you got that handout, right? Take a look at that. Take a look at that, and, and read your email this week, too. You'll get, a, you'll get a good dose of those. So as we close out and um, prepare to maybe make some real important decisions like we did at, some did at 9 o'clock, can I read Isaiah? I love Isaiah. He's such a poet as well as a strong prophet. Chapter 61, you may want to check this out. Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2 is... Um, He's looking ahead again, because that's what prophets did, and he's kind of like playing the part of someone else, and he's quoting that someone else, and he says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance uh, to our God and to comfort all who mourn. You know who he's talking about there that's saying those words? He's talking about a guy that came along 700 years after he died. His name was Jesus. (laughs) Jesus got up in church one day and quoted those two verses, and they wanted to take him out and lynch him. But the funny thing is, every word he spoke was true about him. He came to bind up the brokenhearted. Are you mourning today? You're grieving? You're brokenhearted? Man, that's why he came. Are you deeply disappointed in somebody who let you down? He's your brother. Are you, you feel abandoned, orphaned? He's the father. Everything going on in your world right now He has the strongest healing component of that. He's worth knowing, and he's worth serving. And that's why we have um, a time to celebrate next steps of spiritual life. And Braden, uh, there you are, Braden. If you'll come up and your group come up, why don't you all stand? And as we're transitioning, if you will, uh, if you don't mind, stay in the room for a couple more minutes. Um, if you need to leave a little bit early, if you can leave right after this during the announcement time, because there's maybe somebody on your row that's really n- needing to make a life or death decision here. We don't want to interrupt them. So let's pray. Father, Either you are who you say you are. Or we're all chasing a lie. (laughs) 
Either you are the hope of the world or there is none. Either you're plan A or we're all gone because there is no plan B. Make us more grateful. And make us more open to your love and your correction and your guidance. And please, make us matter more to people that we love. Please don't let us deter somebody from following you because they don't see you in us. So God, please do that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.